find a way to either hit him or kick him.
this machine that I got, is it alone? Is, is it not reading any of your, you know, not reading anybody talking? It'll shut off. Oh, well, battery saving mode. Yeah. yeah. So now when he comes in or they come in, I gotta sit and wait for it to fire up again. Thank you. You guys got all kinds of cute little toys. All right, Channel 4, I'm, I'm kind of sliding your stuff over just a little bit if you don't mind. Look at this. See, you all need to be like, see, Foxy's got it going on with the clippy. All right, see, we're doing, we're doing good. We're doing good. All right, guys, we good? We ready? guys. Um, again, thank you so much for coming this morning. Uh, we sincerely appreciate you being here. First off, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the people that are here that have worked in conjunction on this case with us, and we'll go over this again during the press conference itself. But uh, 
we'd like to acknowledge uh, the Attorney General's office and specifically Chip Payne uh, from the AG's office for helping us out uh, in reference to the Internet Crimes Against Children cases that we've made. Uh, the South Carolina Attorney General's office again with the Department of Homeland Security as well. So the Greenville County Sheriff's Office in conjunction with three, these three agencies uh, have worked together for these cases. So we sincerely appreciate that. Did I miss something, guys? No. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about some things today that are pretty graphic. And, and I'm going to tell you ahead of time, uh, this is not for the faint of heart. This is a, uh, this is a very tough subject. Uh, there's going to be some content in this that uh, that you guys may want to use discretion before you before you send this out um, as far as as the media goes. Um, you know, imagine a, a, a place where a two-year-old is laying in a crib, and that two-year-old is safe and secure uh, with the, with the blessing of life from God. Two years, this child is is been safe and secure in their bedroom. And imagine in the room right next door a predator who's surfing the internet and they're finding thousands upon millions of images of graphic child pornography. And the whole time this predator is processing how can I violate this two-year-old child that's just on the other side of this room. This child who has absolutely no way to defend himself. This child that has absolutely no way to report a crime. This child that is basically laying in a crib and waiting to become a victim because of child pornography. We developed the Internet Crimes Against Children Unit at the Greenville County Sheriff's Office on January 3rd to prevent such situations. I'm going to go over a few cases with you this morning, and I'm going to talk with you and let you know again there's some graphic content in here. So, guys, just bear with me on this. Um, one of the cases we specifically dealt with during the course of this was a, a two-year-old child victim that was compromised in a sexual manner. Um, the, the victim's images where they were being compromised was found on the phone of, of a specific suspect, uh, Brent McJunkin. McJunkin had originally been the victim of a home invasion. Uh, when deputies investigated the incident, uh, during the investigation they yielded evidence to show this heinous and very specific crime. The eventual search warrant executed uh, literally thousands of images were, were located on McJunkin's computer. Again, a predator, two-year-old victim. The victims ranged between 2 and 18 years of age uh, for the ones that we found on, on Mr. McJunkin's phone and, and, and on his computer. Frederick Eugene Wall, Jr., um, he was caught after he showed images to an undercover agent, an undercover uh, investigator, images of a young girl performing sexual acts on a dog. We're talking about graphic, graphic nasty material here, bestiality. We're talking about things that you, your, your nightmares are made of. This is what these children are subjected to in, in every state in the United States, in every country, in every continent of our planet. This is what children are subjected to through these, these predators. These predators that have gone unchecked for so long. Through the investigation into uh, Mr. Walls, um, uh, after, the, after the search warrant was served, um, he was found to be in possession of child pornography. He was charged with 20 counts of sexual exploitation of a minor. 20 counts of sexual exploitation of a minor. He lives here in Greenville. Every case that I'm talking to you about is in Greenville County. I'm going to run down a list real quick to kind of give you an idea of some of the people that, that we've arrested and where they live. Um, Matthew Brian Barry Smith from Taylor's, uh, Brent Wilson from Greenville, uh, Mr. Emery, and you guys will get a copy of this, Mr. Emery from Marietta, Moats from Simpsonville, Caps from Traveler's Rest, uh, from Greer, from Fountain Inn, from Simpsonville, from Traveler's Rest, from Malden, from Taylor's, again, all of these people are in Greenville County, and, and again, like I said last week, this transcends culture, this transcends economics, this transcends uh, any social order that we actually know. This transcends all lines. These are doctors. These are priests. 
These are engineers. These are your neighbors. These are nurses. These are people who you encounter on a daily basis who have such a sick and twisted mind that they choose to victimize children who cannot report these crimes in most cases. Some don't even know that they're a victim because they're so young. And they're subjected to such acts and they're subjected to such torment and torture that this affects these children for the rest of their lives and they may not even know why. And that is why we created this unit. That's why we've worked in conjunction with the Attorney General's office. That's why the Department of Homeland Security has been such a key asset to the Greenville County Sheriff's Office in pushing this agenda forward to eliminate this problem. Again, these cases are real. These are predators that are local. These are people that are your neighbors. These are people that live here. These are people that you work with. The unit, the ICAC unit, and you'll hear me refer to it as ICAC, that's short for Internet Crimes Against Children. The Internet Crimes Against Children unit was developed January the 3rd of 2017, and we were able to put five deputies, five investigators in that unit. Since the inception of, of that unit, we've, we've made multiple cases, and I'll give you those numbers here in a minute, but when I stepped into office January 3rd, we had a backlog of 60 cases. They were sitting there. And it's not because the investigators didn't want to work them. It's because the investigators did not have the time or the resources or the manpower to work these cases. When I talked to these investigators, when I stepped into office, they were dedicated to addressing this problem. They wanted to address this problem, but they couldn't. Again, no resources, no manpower, no time. And with the help of those investigators, from the deputy two level to the sergeant level of the Greenville County Sheriff's Office, we networked and we made, and, and we made a unit that has since been one of the best units I've ever seen. With the work effort, the energy, the, the, the ethics, the morals, the drive to address this problem, these people, these deputies, these investigators, both men and women, compromise their own integrity. They compromise their own psychological safety and well-being so that our county can be protected. I mean, imagine... Imagine taking a look at these images. Imagine just flipping open somebody's phone and all of a sudden you see a, a form of bestiality involving a two-year-old. That's not something that, that's normal for a person to see. The Department of Homeland Security have investigators that are specifically dedicated to this. The Attorney General's Office have investigators that are specifically dedicated to this. And these men and women, again, jeopardize their own psychological integrity to investigate these cases. They have put their families aside, knowing that they can never erase these images, knowing that these images will never leave their mind, knowing that these victims are out there, and knowing that they see one victim on a phone of a thousand images and they can't identify the 999 other victims. But those victims are out there and they're no less important than the one that we've identified. And they sleep with this every single night. During the course of this investigation, and I'm going to tell you a personal story, during the course of this investigation, I went out on some of these search warrants. And when we went out, we used uh, specialized teams to execute these warrants. And we were very soft in our approach in some cases and very hard in others. It, it, the, the situation itself kind of dictated how we addressed specific cases. We rolled up on one scene. It was in a, it was in a court of a cookie cutter neighborhood. And um, there's, two, there's two guys that are sitting out on the hood of the car. When I get there, two deputies that are sitting out on the hood of the car and they're talking to each other. And I get out, I'm like, hey guys, I appreciate your, appreciate your hard work and thank you for being here. I know this is not what you wanted to do when you got up this morning, but I appreciate you being here. And the look on their faces immediately told me that I had to ask the question, how are you? The response from one of the investigators was, I'll never get those images out of my head. This is something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. And not in a good way. So... When you lay your head down tonight, when you say your prayers, and when you thank God for what you have, make sure you thank him for those investigators because they step in and intervene. They're the wall that protects you and your family. So make sure that you remember them when you say your prayers tonight because those men and women are jeopardizing their own integrity, both physically and psychologically, to be out there to intervene on your behalf. Again, we had 60 backlog cases um, when we started this. Uh, the downloading and dissemination of child pornography are the main topics that we address. 
Um, working alongside, again, the Attorney General's Office in the Department of Homeland Security, we began kind of diving into these cases. Uh, and a lot of these cases we receive tips and information on. Uh, they come from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and that comes through the Attorney General's Office. So we take those tips and we're able to identify these, these situations, uh, these potential crimes, and address these potential crimes and move forward uh, with the investigation. And, and again, it's your standard investigation that we conduct on every single one of these cases. I don't want to call it a cookie cutter, but we absolutely follow the same protocol on every single case, whether it's state, local, or federal. Now, when it comes time for prosecution, things are a little bit different. So since the inception uh, of the ICAC unit, we've arrested 21 people. We've signed 143 warrants on 21 people. We've executed 27 search warrants and 21 cases have been cleared by arrest. So you do the numbers, 21 arrests, 21 cleared, cleared cases. And the 60 backlog take into consideration that when we plug the computer back up, uh, we started getting more. So we've had to not only catch up, but keep up at the same time. So a lot of the, the 143 warrants that were signed were multiple warrants on one person. So you'll see 21 arrests and 143 warrants you can divide it and get the average yourself. Roughly a third of these cases are probably going to go federal. And just to kind of answer your guys' question ahead of time, uh, what actually does it take for the feds to adopt a case? Um, there are some, some pretty extenuating circumstances that have to be there for the feds to adopt it. Uh, bestiality is one. The egregious amount of downloads uh, and, and the, the actual number of images or the contact the extreme vulgar circumstances uh, potentially involving torture, again, or bestiality. Um, and when you're looking at repeat offenders, also the heavy volume of case uh, determines exactly whether or not the feds will adopt the, the case itself. Um, I think it's important to note that during the course of this investigation, we arrested one individual named Ray Mote, M-O-T-T-E. And again, you guys are going to get copies of all these warrants. Uh, Mr. Mote, uh, during the course of this, his investigation was found to have one of the largest uh, files or amount of child pornography in South Carolina history. And he's in Greenville. So some of the largest amount of traffic child pornography is coming out of Greenville, South Carolina. And, and a lot of you guys know that this is, a, this is kind of a big thing for me. And I'll get you the name of it because it, it slips my head right now. Um, there is a program that we can actually log on to and take a look at and watch, I want to say real time, but pretty close to real time people, people fishing for child porn. You can kind of pop up, uh, it may be a 12 hour delay. Mike, is it a 12 hour delay? Yeah, okay, so we're looking at about a 12 hour delay, but within 12 hours, you bring this map up over to the United States, and it looks like a rainbow. There's colors everywhere. Thousands of cases in a 12 hour day. Thousands of cases, tens of thousands of cases in a 12 hour day in the United States of people fishing. And Greenville is not immune to this problem. Over the course of, uh, of the last several weeks, we've hosted an event. Um, it was a week-long event, and I believe it was actually last week that we hosted the event. It was investigative techniques uh, on how to deal with ICAT cases across the country. Uh, we hosted the event. We had 23 people attend from, uh, from South Carolina, North Carolina, and Florida. So we were very blessed to be able to host that event. Uh, and we want to be the lead agency in South Carolina. We want to be at the forefront of this problem. We want to be who everyone looks to as a model to deal with these cases. And there, there are people that deal with this much more than we do. They have many more resources than we do. They have much more manpower than we do. I'm begging those agencies throughout this country. I'm begging the people of South Carolina, the sheriffs, the chiefs, address this problem. Identify these, these people. Apply some manpower to it. Go to your county council. Go to your city council. Go to your city administrators. Go to your county administrators. If you only get one person, call me. You can come work with us. We'll help you address the problems in your area. Because this is a statewide issue, and anything that happens in Ori, anything that happens in Newberry transcends to Greenville County. And anything that happens in Greenville County transcends across the state. The predators know no lines, and the victims know no lines. So we're here to help whoever, whenever, however we can in addressing this problem. Going forward, essentially what is the goal? 
The goal is to increase the manpower of this unit. Technology. Technology is an ever-evolving thing. And when you're working with a government agency the size of Greenville County, your resources are limited. We're very fortunate to have the Attorney General's Office. We're very fortunate to have the Department of Homeland Security. Where we're able to draw certain resources in, but that doesn't apply manpower to our agency. We need a reoccurring budget for technology, for computers, for certain systems that we need to identify these people. We need a reoccurring budget specifically for ICAC. The goal is to make so many cases that people cannot turn their heads. Political officials, appointed officials, can no longer turn their head from this and say, this is not a problem so that we ourselves can draw in the resources that we need at the Greenville County Sheriff's Office to address this issue. Again, all mug shots and warrants will be emailed uh, at the conclusion of the press conference. You guys will have everything you need. Um, I'll be glad to take a few questions, and I've got some people in the room that can kind of help me with a few of these questions if we get to the technical side. Again, we're not going to go into specifics on investigative techniques or, or the, the systems that we use or the softwares that we use. But um, I'm sure when you guys do some research, you'll find that there's multiple applications out there. So, questions? Sure, this is a pretty, uh, pretty dire warning and, and certainly frightening to any parent who may uh, listen to what you just said. What is the takeaway for, for parents? What, what danger, uh, as you had pointed out early in your comments, what danger are their children possibly in as a result of this? Well, again, you know, some of the, some of the parents uh, that are listening have children that are two years old. You know, they're, they're not online. They don't have cell phones or, or anything like that. They're not technologically savvy or old enough to have these kind of devices. Um, you know, for the two-year-olds, uh, for, for, the, for the parents who have children that are very young, you know, monitor your children. When you, when you, when you bring in someone, let's say a nanny, or when you have a, a, a person that's in the house, you know, I'm just going to come right out and say it. Check your husband. Check your wife. Check your brothers. Check your sisters. Check your siblings. I mean, if, if something doesn't look right, it's probably not. And, and if you want to know why somebody's taking pictures of or, or, or uh, why someone wants to be around your children at certain or specific times, you know, where they may be bathing or changing clothes or something along those lines, you need to be aware of these types of situations. Um, you know, just, just monitor that. Um, when it comes to the kids who have technology, uh, the older children, you know, your, your teenagers or, you know, your preteens, uh, monitor their I mean, closely, closely monitor their social media, closely monitor their cell phones. My, my daughters, you know, I have a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old daughter. I can tell you their passcodes to their phones. I know every text message that they're sending. I know every picture that they're sending. My wife is monitoring their social media constantly. She probably spends 30, hour, 30 minutes a night, 45 minutes a night, scrolling back through Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram trying to figure out what my kids have done that day. I highly recommend you be a parent. I highly recommend that you not be your child's friend, that you be your child's parent, and that you get involved in what your children are doing and know where they are and, and monitor exactly what they're doing. Hey, until they're 18 years old, they're yours. So I strongly encourage you to know every step that they're taking. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Katie. It's, it's really, really important for people to know that if you're the victim of something like this, or you think you're the victim of, of something like this, you need to, if you're in school, if you will contact maybe a guidance counselor and let them know, contact a teacher and let them know. If you think your teachers or your guidance counselor are involved in this, because again, this transcends all lines, uh, let your parents know. If you don't feel comfortable letting your parents know, we have an option for you. You can pick up the phone and call us. Again, the easiest number for a kid to remember is 23 crime. That's the easiest number for a child to remember. Pick up the phone and dial 23 crime and let us know that you think that you're the victim, and we will come talk to you. We will come find you. We will, we will help you to walk through this. We have victim advocates. We have victim, victim services. Uh, we have investigators that are trained in this area. We have investigators that are trained to talk to children specifically. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to get the resources you need no matter what age you are. So again, 2-3-CRIME, pick up
pick up the phone and dial it if you think that you're the victim of something like this, or even if you've seen something that you know is just not right. If you're in school and you're, you know, you, you get a mass text message from somebody and it's something that's grotesque. You know, we've, how many times have we heard of that here in the upstate just in the schools where you get a mass text message of, of, of a nude uh, uh, underage person? Let us know. We need to know that. We need to be involved in that. In the course of your investigations, uh, have you found that, that any of the people uh, who were in possession of child pornography have also acted upon these impulses? Yes. Have, have yes, we have. Uh, and, and that's where, you know, that's where it just becomes so scary. Uh, you know, and, and I forgot the actual percentage numbers, and, and Chris, maybe you can help me out with that, but I know there's some percentages <laughs> of number of offenders who become contact offenders, and I think it's in the 20s, 30s? Yeah, 25% of these, of these people become actual contact offenders. So every time we remove... You know, uh, you know, four people off the street, one of them is going to become a, a, an eventual contact offender by statistics alone. Uh, when we've arrested some of these people, we've given them the option to sit down and talk with us during the course of interviews. Uh, they've admitted to being contact offenders on cases that we knew nothing about, where the victims never came forward. So we were able to actually move forward and, and make charges on them uh, for being contact offenders, which is huge. That's huge, because if they've contact offended one, how many have they that we don't know about? Can you tell us where some of these arrests took place? I know you said that you won't go into specifics about how you <coughs> came upon some of the suspects, mm -hmm. but you did mention, like, their doctors, teachers. Yeah, we're go with, with the list that we're going to get you guys via email, you're going to get all that, uh, you're going to get all that information. I think we had one, I think we had one priest, uh, I think we had a doctor, um, I think we had uh, few engineers, uh, we had some retirees, um, we've had some children uh, that were, uh, you know, living with their parents, um, and, and uh, you know, some 30-year-olds that were living with their parents in their kid's basement, I mean, in their parents' basement, um, not a shock to anybody, but that, you know, that, that was, you know, that were, that were fishing porn, um, but again, I, I, just some of the areas that we talked about where these search warrants were executed and these people live. Uh, Taylor's, Greenville, Marietta, Simpsonville, Traveler's Rest, Greer, um, Fountain Inn. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were all over the county. I mean, it pockmarks the entire county. What kind of message do you want to send to the, let's say, future person that may get into this? So for those of you who are considering it uh, and, and think that this is a good idea and, and, a, and a way for you to go, um, put some put some time back. Uh, think think about it. Um, well, you know, we'll give you 25 years to, to think about it. We'll give you somewhere between 25 and life to consider whether or not this was a this was a good opportunity for you. Um, you know, I, you just can't stop some people from being stupid, and and they're gonna they're gonna do it either way. Um, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much money we put into this, no matter how much effort we put into this, you're still going to have the dummy who gets out there and thinks that this is a good idea and they're going to continue to do it. Uh, you know, to that person, I just, I just simply warn you that, uh, that, that we will be coming for you and, and when we knock on your door, you're going to be facing 25 plus. So some of these kids may be afraid of being some backlash, their predators may be threatening to blackmail them, they mm -hmm. maybe have this hip or fear by sending pictures, I can now be put behind bars. Mm -hmm. what Again, Katie, that's a, that's a great question. And, and, you know, we start delving into the, to the psychology of, of children at that point, and, you know, in a teenager. Like I said, I've got two myself, and I'm, I'm lost every single night. I get involved in a conversation with them at the dinner table. So trying to get into the psyche of a 16-year-old uh, and, and letting them know, hey, you are an actual victim, uh, the only thing that I can do is, is express to them that you are, in fact, a victim, and, and we do, in fact, care. And what you've done is, is we, we can work through that. We can, we can get through it, I promise you. We will hold your hand, and we will be with you every step of the way to get through this. But if you don't come forward to us, then we cannot address this problem. It is so vitally important 
for you as a teenager. It's so vitally important for you as a young person to come forward and, and let us know you feel like you've been victimized. And, 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 and it's so important for us to take on the role as, as leaders in the community to let them know that we're here for them. We're not going to judge you. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to, to, to lay blame on you for this. We are here to help you. I don't know why you made the decision, and quite frankly, I don't care. The fact is you made the choice, and we want to help you get out of whatever circumstance that you're in. Blackmail is a crime in South Carolina. The only way we can address it is if you help us. And, and we've, got to, we've got to work together hand-in-hand hand with these kids. Have to. Anything else? So where law enforcement has failed for many years is uh, programs that they're known as EAPs. They're, they're, they're psychological programs for law enforcement. We have, we have implemented programs in the state of South Carolina that are short-lived and short-term. Uh, when we have officers that are involved in critical situations, um, we're able to help them for a very short period of time. Um, there's no long-term plan in place. And I have a major that works here at the sheriff's office, and she has taken a very, very special interest in this. This is something that she brought to my attention upon me coming into office. So what we're looking at now is we're looking at, again, it's, it's, it's ex very expensive. It's funded is really where the key is. Um, and we want to build a program here to help these deputies. Again, short term, we're able to kind of help them out. Long term, we're not. And things don't end in six months. Your memories don't clear out of your mind in six months. It doesn't work that way. So I need to develop a long-term program for, for these deputies to be helped. The problem is there are fly-by-night psychologists and there are fly-by-night people who want to jump in for a six-month program for a contract and they want to throw a pill at you and tell you if you'll take the pill, you'll sleep better uh, and, and come back and talk to me in a week and we'll talk about, you know, why you lost your puppy when you were four years old. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the problems, the real problems that are addressing these deputies, and that costs money. And we just don't have the resources for that. I can't, I can't chase the, the victims and chase the suspects, and then when that funding is dried up, I, I can't just make funding come from somewhere else. So again, I'm looking for anyone who has a plan that's in place. I'm looking, and I've met with multiple people, but again, everybody sees a government agency, and the first thing they want to do is milk it for money every time. Nobody cares about the interest of the law enforcement or the person itself. They care about the money that they can make in the process. And I'm just not willing to, to throw money at some fly-by-night person for that. So we're developing a program. I hope that program is implemented sooner rather than later. Anything else? Thank you guys so very much for coming.